Drop in the untold stories of industry leaders, influencers, and insights on future innovation. I'm John Davidson, and this is the DLC DLC Drop Drop Podcast. Podcast. Welcome, everybody, to the DLC Drop Podcast. It is my pleasure to invite my personal friend, Mark Brickman, onto the show today. Mark is an incredible artist. He's an inspiration to me, having worked with Pink Floyd back in the heyday, Steven Spielberg, Paul McCartney. You could go on and on. He's currently the artist in residence at the Empire State Building. Mark, welcome to the show. Hi, John. How are you? I'm doing Thank good. You for having me. What are you up to today? Um, just looking at the ocean and taking it kind of, you know, today is a kind of nice day. It's not 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 crazy today. So That's awesome. Just, um, I think the best uh the best breakfasts that I've ever had are whenever you and I hang out in Malibu. Oh yeah, at the Soho house. That was fun. Right. Yeah, it's it's you can it's open. I mean, you can get out on the deck and they do the, you know, social distancing and they're 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 running just, you know, with a reduced staff and and occupancy. So they still have it going? I've been there a couple times um since since they reopened. It's been fun. Nice. Nice, nice. beautiful. Well, I'd love to start this off. I love doing this with guests who are personal friends of mine. Um, started off with uh, our versions of how we first met. Because I know my version, but I don't quite know your version. And I just think it'd be su- super interesting to start. So uh, would you like to go first or you want me to go first? Uh, um, it's your show. You tell me what you okay. like. I'll go first. Okay. So I had just started at PRG production resource group and I was in the LA office and you know I'm drinking from the fire hose a mile a minute and I'm super excited about this new job to work with this amazing production company and lead esports and our good friend Jens Zimmerman which by the way I do a pretty on on point Jens Zimmerman impression so I want you to judge this John uh I want you to meet Mark Brickman uh Mark come will come into the office today uh you meet mark and then you find way to uh produce esports how on magic (laughs) (laughs) yes is the best he is he is so so yen so yeah yen said that to me in exactly that way and i was like who's mark brickman (laughs) because i'm you know i'm i'm not uh it's an obvious question. Yeah. <laughs> and then I, I mentioned it to a couple people around the office. I was like, yeah, Mark Brickman's coming in to meet. And people were like, like, oh my gosh, Mark Brickman's coming to meet with you? Oh, how exciting. I was like, I should probably Google this guy, you know? And I was like, okay. And you found nothing on Google. <laughs> found a few things. Just I was like, dang, what is this guy going to be like? You know, he sounds important. You know, and and so I was all excited the next day for us to meet. You came in wearing all white. I re- I remember. Uh, I was like, okay, either he's got style or he just got done painting. Not I'm, sure. I'm the opposite of Steve Jobs. <laughs> and so you came into the. I remember you came into the the office. Uh, we were meeting in Jens's office, and it was a 30 minute meeting that turned into a two hour just enjoyable discussion. And uh, who was it who came in? Um, John Weissman. Yeah, John Weissman came in. With um, with a couple other people, but I can't remember. Curry Grant. Curry Grant was the other one. It was Curry Grant. I think there was two. And then somebody else came in, too. There was somebody else that came in. I yeah, can't it, remember who it was, was. almost oh, it embarrassing. Was the, it was the CEO of of uh the not the music no it wasn't randy it was the other ceo next door to yens yes I can't the ceo of the entire company came in and was like it's such an honor to meet you and gave you his business card i was like how am i in this office like i feel like a lot of other people should be in here right now but i remember when curry grant came in and you guys were talking about like some billionaire who had a boat and they wanted you to go on the boat and you didn't want to go and i said when is when do you have to go on that? And you said September 29th. Oh, yeah. I didn't want to go, right? Yeah. And I said, dude, I'm going to Philadelphia to the Overwatch League Grand Finals. Why don't you come with me so that we can both witness it in person and your crazy creative mind can be unleashed? 
and you said, I'm from Philadelphia. And I blew off the boat. <laughs> and you blew off the boat. And then later I found out that you are uh, part of the Hall of Fame of the city of Philadelphia, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah. So that's my version. I'd love to hear yours. It, it's pretty close to the same one. But um, <laughs> it, it started the day before. And I woke up in the morning. I was going through my emails and saw this newsletter from an industry publication. And at the bottom, it said, you know, interesting people and it had your mug and it and it had your name and it said newly hired for esports and that's an area that i've been trying to like jump into and understand for the past probably three four years and i went oh this is natural i i can i can get to this guy this looks like fun and so i picked up the phone and i called yes and um and uh the rest of the story is absolutely true. I was there the next day. Yeah. yeah. I, no, that was incredible. And then we also almost froze to death in Minneapolis uh, at another two times. time. Two, two times. Two times. Yeah. Two times. Two times. Right before, yeah, right before the pandemic, actually. Yeah. That's a shame because what we were talking about there was actually going to, could have been really cool at the Minneapolis Convention Center that with those those um those inside of the auditorium those private breakout rooms they were that, that was one of the coolest things i ever saw in my life so i was a little disappointed that you know can't really go to minneapolis anymore but um it's a, it's it's sad everything's sad it is yeah for people who uh, i won't give the entire vision to people but for people who have been to the minneapolis convention center or have not they've got these domes that rotate and so it's it's almost like the room, like the convention center itself, is on turntables. And so well, they, they are. They're, 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 well, it's the auditorium. The convention yeah. center itself is wide open. But remember, the guy said they had four hundred and twenty-five events a year. There's only three hundred and sixty-five days in a year. <laughs> that means there's something going on in that place every day. But the auditorium and those dome rooms were pretty much left alone. People didn't use them. They were trying to find a way to repurpose those. So we were going to try to put esports in those domes. Right. It it could have been really cool. And maybe it will be one day. We'll we'll see. Maybe we'll find out. Yeah. So you've done some incredible things in your career. Tell take me back to like when you were in high school, when you were, you know, just trying to set up some lights to get the girls' attention, you know, like walk me through from like before you had started to like that big break, like what was, or the thing that kind of catapulted you? Um, yeah, I, I mean, in high school, I started building a light show. I, I, I don't know really what got me there, but it seemed to, I mean, I, I probably had ADHD, but they didn't have labels back then. So you were just, you know, you were just a troubled child that couldn't pay attention. But anyway, um, um, we, um, I built a light show, then went on to, um, you know, I graduated high school, didn't last long in college, and then went off and um, got a job at this light, lighting company in, in Philadelphia. Uh, within, I guess it was about a year of working there, um, there was an accident and the owner, one of the owners got lost his life. And, um, and uh, I ended up becoming partners with this, um, I was 19, and, and the guy I became partners with was a 63-year-old guy who was actually responsible for discovering NFL films, the telephoto lens, the, one of the first animated series besides Mickey Mouse called Diver Dan. And, and, um, and then in, in, in my building, the, the, he was actually the consultant to um, uh, Garrett Brown, who invented Steadicam. So Steadicam was actually was, was built at nighttime up in my second floor of my warehouse. So that was kind of my education when I was 19, 20 years old. Um, I was also a stagehand in the Philadelphia local. And, and, and we used to load in shows, a lot of ballet and opera. So I, I got, I, I really cut my chops on, 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 you know, traditional theatrical and, and, and movie making. But I also ran a lot of nightclubs in terms of putting lighting in to nightclubs on the Jersey Shore. So I, I was a pretty busy young man 
Um, then I met Bruce Springsteen and, and, uh, then the world changed for me. I think I've heard that name before. So t- the 63-year-old man, how, how did you get in touch with this guy in the first place? How, well, how he was kind of working at the lighting company where I was working. He didn't mm-hmm. own it. So when um, the owner was a guy named Dave Cutler, his son was Adam. Adam was 25 years old, and he got killed in a motorcycle accident one night. Oh, wow. And so Dave didn't want the, the business anymore. Uh, it had been the business itself had been there for 50 years. It was the it was the premier lighting distributor vendor for the tri-state area. So Philadelphia, New Jersey, Maryland, you know, um, Delaware. Um, and, and, you know, so, I mean, it, it had a big reach. It, it, it went all the way out to probably mid, mid-state Pennsylvania. It was a big business. So um, Lou and then my family, since I didn't go to college, my dad helped out with some finances to become the part, put, make me the partner. So it was me cool. and Lou became partners. So there's a Bruce Springsteen character that I've, I was a big I've fan. Heard of him. Yeah. <laughs> I was a big fan. So in 72, Bruce was really big in Philadelphia and he would play these clubs or colleges. And I met him at a college one night and I, I showed up with my light show in a station wagon and, um, his manager and Bruce noticed that I knew all the cues, like lighting cues, like the stage would go dark because his music is so dynamic. And um, so I started following him around at night. I wasn't busy enough and I started following him around. And then it, the more I followed around, the more, you know, I became known as his lighting person. And as he started getting bigger, I I stayed up until the point where we played um, the bottom line, this club that's no longer in New York City. And Clive Davis came in there and watched the show along with everybody else one night and told Bruce and his manager that they had to hire me. They had to take me away from whatever I was doing and Bruce was going to break big. And and that was, and then we started touring nationally. You know, it was my first trip out to LA. I was probably 21, maybe something like that. What was that? What was that like going on that first tour with such a big production? Well, it wasn't big. It was really small. I mean, Bruce, at the time they were breaking him, so they broke him in a club out here in L.A. called the Troubadour the yep. first time out, and we played the Celebrity Theater in Phoenix, where he was also fairly large. But the both, both like the Celebrity Theater is twenty three hundred seats. But back then, we're talking like nineteen seventy three, seventy four. Lighting was really very basic. I mean, right. the shows are really small. I mean, if you were the Rolling Stones, you had a lot of what you called par cans, which were these, you know, non-moving instruments. And um, there was a my hero was a, a gentleman by the name of Chip Monk who invented the par. <laughs> Chip Monk. Yeah, Chip Monk. And he's actually he's alive Amazing. and well in in Australia. He was the voice of Woodstock. If you ever watch the movie or listen to the album and you hear the voice go you know, do not eat the brown acid. That really deep, really <laughs> professional voice. That was Chipmunk. He was like the greatest lighting designer ever back then. He did the Stones. He did Woodstock. He did did everyone. Um, we're friends. Yeah. Um, but he at the time, I was just like this little kid watching all the stuff that he did. It was great. I mean, so he was an inspiration of yours when you were Huge inspiration. Up. Yeah, he was huge. So what was he doing specific? Was there anything specific that he was doing that you just... He was doing things that nobody else ever thought of, you know? He was just inventing stuff left and right. I mean, he he just completely turned the industry upside down. Because up until that time, it was very... It had been the same, just like, you know, just like everything else in the world. You know, I mean, it there's there's always new things coming up, just like esports and technology now and just that what we're doing in the moment. You know, I mean, 30 years ago, this would never have been, you know, this could never have happened. So so, so how long were you on tour with uh, Bruce Springsteen? I was uh, I was uh, I, I, I was with Bruce for about 10 years. Wow. And during that 10 years, I also managed a band called Southside Johnny and the Asbury Jukes. And then I started and, and I met Carol King. And the, when when Bruce played the second time out here in L.A., um, he played at the Roxy and that was a star studded evening. And I met the owner, the guy who owns the whiskey, the rainbow, the Roxy. He became a really close friend. He's no longer with us anymore. 
but I met all the major stars out here the second time around. So I started working for them also when Bruce was in the studio recording. Okay. So my career started really taking off. I had left the lighting company in Philadelphia, I'd sold it to a competitor and um, came out here with my first wife. And, um, cool. and my parents had moved out a year before. So it was like I relocated in 78, 77, 77, 78. And that was to LA or where were you? To LA. Yeah. And I, and I, this has been my home base since 78. Nice. So where, so where you live now, you've been in that same area. No, I've lived around LA. I, I've been here though, since uh, 1991. So almost 30 years, 29 years right now. Right. So in Malibu, in this neighborhood, in Malibu. Same yeah. Location. I mean, don't yeah. move. Cause it gives me a, great excuse to come to that area yeah no it's it's you know it's 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 special it's gotten a little too popular for me on in the summer on the weekends but it's okay right i took a big long walk this morning i feel pretty good good so you were so bruce is in the studio you're kind of side hustling i guess and so what did that, what was the next thing that that led you to as you were building a name well, for yourself? What, what it led me to is everyone was coming to see Bruce when he was playing. Unbeknownst to me, um, a film director who just passed away named Alan Parker and Roger Waters from Pink Floyd came and saw a Springsteen show one night while Roger was putting the finishing touches on the wall. And yeah. I didn't, I didn't know they were there. Um, in, um, in the, in the, uh, I guess it would have been the winter of December uh, of 79. One afternoon, I got a phone call in my studio in my house. And it was an English bloke who um, told me that he was the manager of Pink Floyd and that um, I needed to come down you're to like, the no rehearsal. Way. No, you're not. <laughs> I, yeah. And they were opening the next night. Like they had been building the show down. Everyone in the business knew they had been in town building this insane show on a scale nobody has ever even attempted before in 1979. Wow. And I got that. So I didn't believe the guy. I, I thought he was an English friend of mine pulling my leg. So I asked for 25 tickets in, <laughs> on that call for the next night. Did you get him? There, there was silence. And then <laughs> he said, um, I don't think you understand. I am Steve O'Rourke. I am Pink Floyd's manager. I'll ask you again, would you mind coming down here to speak with us? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I went down. And, yeah, I think we all would have. And I was given the task to, um, to, to, to re rearrange the show in less than 16 hours, which was, um, um, it was, it, it, which I, was I did it. Impossible. I did it. <laughs> yeah, it was, you know, it was a challenge. But I did it and, and pulled it off. And obviously, uh, as a matter of fact, this morning I was texting with David Gilmore. So I'm still obviously, um, That's awesome. you know, I still have a relationship with them, believe it or not. So you must not have screwed it up on night one when they asked no, you to completely no. redo the. It was it was great, man. It was man. it's probably the same thrill that you would get when you're skateboarding or, you know, doing right. your when you're winning in what you used to do. Same thing. So when they, great. what was that feeling or that thought that first went through your head when they're like, okay, by tomorrow, we want you to do this. Was there any hesitation or were you just like, let's go? Yeah, I, I, I didn't hesitate. I mean, it, it just happened to me right before I got on this call. Something I've been working on for a very, 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 very long time. Yeah. Just happened. Someone said yes. Awesome. And, and it's so huge that I kind of like, had no emotion whatsoever. As a matter of fact, I, a couple of people that are around me, I, they've all looked at me like, what? And I went, I don't know. I don't feel anything, but I know I, it's good. It's good. It was, right. You know, cause you, at some point in that process, no matter what you're doing creatively, at some point in your life, when you're, when you're faced with those opportunities and you've done a lot of hard work to get there, because you've chosen a certain path, right? Um, you have to let go. You know, you just let go of of it. You you can't keep pounding, pounding, pounding. So you you get to a point where you know you're competent and 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 you can accept 
if it does happen or you can accept the failure one right. or the other but you just have to let go and that's kind of what i let go last week on this project i could feel myself oh, wow. let go it was really like i went i've done everything i can i've worked so hard yeah i'm letting go you know and and whatever yeah. happened happened you know i could be um you ever hear that song k sarah sarah Doris Day? No, huh? Sorry, I'm, I'm aging myself, man. <laughs> I mean, yeah, love that song. It's my ringtone. Yeah, it's okay, man. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, it's my ringtone when you call from now on. Um, I think that's super interesting. You know, it's it's so funny. Um, I've experienced this a couple times, probably not as many as you, but like, it takes a long time for stuff to land a lot of times. I mean, sometimes things are quick, but I think a long times I've spent, you know, five years just maintaining a relationship when there either wasn't an opportunity or, or we couldn't get it to work. And then finally something changes or the, the, the stars align. But I think too, it's true in just even broader life where when you don't try to force it, like the stuff that should happen happens. What, what's your take on that? Well, I, I think the, I agree with what you're saying. And, and I just think that it's all about recognizing opportunity that, you, that mm. it, and it, and inside of that, you know, you feeling confident that you can go one way, or if you're not confident, not to say no because of fear or don't say yes, because of fear, the fear is going to kill you. You know, if you have a fear right. or you have a fear of taking risk, which a lot of people just don't want to take risks. They, that's just not, you know, not everybody's the same, you right. know? So uh, there's always these different levels of, you know, what someone's going to do. The, the, the aspirational economy and, and mindset that we all live in these days, I feel sometimes is a little overblown because, um, you know, we're, we're all different. We're all humans. We're all right. wired just a little differently, programmed a little differently. It's kind of like, you know, your cell phone. If you pick up my cell phone, I pick up yours. We They look completely different with the way they operate, the way yeah. they work. I mean, it, no two cell phones are exactly alike. Well, that just mirrors, you know, who we are. So I think there's a lot in that. But if you are wired like me, I take risk. That, right. That's what I do. And all the time with my creativity and, um, Interesting. and I think sports people probably take risk all the time with their bodies, you know, right. with their endurance and their mental ability to get to that next place. You know, um, other people are happy just living a quiet life. So I think it's, yeah. Yeah. I think it's I've thought a lot about that. I think, you know, I think society, assigns values, you know, so like I see everybody as equal and that society says, oh, you have this skill that we value more because you're at the, you're on the stage. Right. And then other people have other skills that are equal, but they're just different. And society may not value them because it's a, it's a background role. But one thing that I've experienced, and I, I think, you know, you believe in this is the people like you couldn't do what you do if you didn't have the people who support you, right? Oh, no, absolutely. It's all about collaboration teams yeah. and, 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 and also recognizing that it's, I, you know, that it's not just me. I mean, I'm, I might be the band leader or the conductor or, you know, but I, I did start nowhere. I did start, you know, yeah. Packing trucks and driving trucks and, doing all the things you do to learn, to learn. I think that part of the world has gone away. So my daughter's 11 yeah. and um, yesterday or two days ago, she has a huge interest in, 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 a, in, the, in the sea, you know, cause we live by the ocean. So right. there's a turtle rescue. We wanted to get her a job and maybe helping the people to turtle rescue in the neighborhood and they wouldn't do it. Liability. Mm. You know, and I, right. I think it would, even if COVID wasn't here and there wasn't this mask issue, which she wears a mask all the time, right. I still think they probably wouldn't let her do it. Like they've huh. stopped letting kids, teenage from like 11 to 17, have jobs that are that get them interested in normal everyday life. 
you know, everybody thinks they're, you know, can be a rock star. I think that's what I meant by right. the overexposure of just being alive, you know, and living. Yeah. And I think too, you know, we have such access to being a rock star. Like it's probably <laughs> like it's or or pretending to be one, right? Like you that's could, fair. yeah. Cause you could, you know, Instagram can make you feel like a rock star. Snapchat can make you feel like a rock star and you're not one, but like back when you didn't have those channels, the only way you could feel like a rock star is if you were actually a rock star. But and it, so, and at the end of the day though, it's pretty insular in terms of like, like these people that are getting millions of hits, even the Kardashians, they're, they're just in that universe. But in the right, bigger right. picture of the world, I don't think they're that important. Just like right. big rock stars weren't, they were important in certain markets uh -huh. And they were globally, yes, but inside, if you were paying attention to that world, but there were plenty of places we would go to. No one ever heard of Pink Floyd. They, no Good idea. Point. No, no idea. What's funny, I remember I, I had the opportunity to work with Rob Deerdick quite a bit and back in the day, and he's a he's a professional skateboarder. And then he, he basically like turned MTV upside down in a good way with his shows, Robin Big and Ridiculousness and all these things. But I knew who he was because I'm a skateboarder. And so I've known who he was my whole life. But once I started working with him, I was like, yeah, you know, we're working with Rob Deerdick. I was shocked how many people were like, who's that? And I was like, whoa, I thought this dude was famous. And he is, but it's to your point. It's called narrow casting, <laughs> not broadcasting. <laughs> narrow, narrow casting. casting. But I that's okay. Word today. Yeah. I mean, that, that, it's good because it's a good life. You know, you right. get you find your niche and you and you can be really happy. Well, one of the things that I love so much, uh, do you know who Seth Godin is? He's like a big time marketer guy, writes books. So he talks about minimal viable audience. And I think about this all the time because I'm like, OK, you know, I look at, you know, I just started my own company, DLC. That's a lot of obviously. words for narrow casting. <laughs> well, if you're writing a book, you got to fill those pages up, right? Oh, um, uh, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> So, so as I think, I'm like, okay, I need X amount of dollars a month to pay my bills, right? Like that's the minimum I need to bring in. And then if I could make more than that, that's great. But I think if I could make my life simple, if I could serve two or three people a month or brands a month, I'm good. And I don't have the headaches of the overhead and building the beast and stuff. I did it. The, I did it the completely opposite way. I never figured out how much I needed to live. Okay. I just, I figured out how I wanted to live. Dang. Oh, and then I, that informed the money. You yeah. know, it, it was kind of, you know, because if you're, you're putting, cause that putting a lot of pressure on you. If, cause that becomes your, your basis for living, your basis for okay. living is that having to go to make that money every month to live a certain way that you think you want to, but you haven't figured it out yet. If you really like that way. Of living. Right. So I, I kind of, I was lucky. I was really lucky. I mean, incredibly lucky. Maybe ignorant is a better word. Okay. What, tell me young. about that. Completely ignorant, thinking I could do it because you, when you're 20, 21, you think you can do anything. You know, you're, you know, oh, man. the world is never going to end. You know, I have nailed some job interviews that I got hired for. And then I found out whoa, if I had actually knew what I was getting myself into, I would have been too intimidated even to try. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, I'm sitting there. I mean, sometimes I ended up in, um, I'm in this, um, you know, crazy place. And um, yeah, I, I, I sometimes I'll pinch myself. I used to. Like yeah. I, I'd be in some, some really weird just encounters or, 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 moments that are happening around me and i and i would just like go wow you know i mean one yeah it's been a i just been really lucky that's all i can say it's that's been awesome i think one of the things that whether it was luck or skill or or right place right time whatever it was you you told me about this is is the 92 olympics right with the opening ceremony <laughs> yeah. you do you want to share a little bit about that because when you you told me about it and your approach which was completely different from what they'd done before. And I, I thought that was incredible. Well, the, I, I, once again, I, I used to, have, I still do have an unlisted phone number. Not that that means anything, but back then that was the only way people communicated were landlines. Right. Um, and um, 
And I got a phone call one day and it was, um, uh, he was, he, he was uh, um, this gentleman uh, from Barcelona who was the executive producer of the opening, opening closing ceremonies of the Barcelona Olympics. And he said to me in his big, deep, you know, Spanish voice, you know, yeah. I have a list here. And he started naming off all my competitors because this was nine, <laughs> this was 1991, I think, or the end of 1990, 91. And he um, went through the list and he, next to each one of those names, he kept saying the word safe. And then he said, and then I come to your name, you know, and he says, and it says risk, you know, <laughs> and, and, and he says, will you come to Barcelona? So I, yeah, I jumped on a plane. High risk, high reward. When I got there, you know, they, it was amazing. It was like, just, I was the only American. Everybody else was Spanish from all over Spain. Um, they were very proud of their country. They were, they didn't want the American broadcast way of doing things. What they wanted was they wanted a different look. Because, and I looked mm -hmm. around the stadium. And the first thing I noticed was that all they had were stadium lights you know, the big white sports lights. Right. And I said to him, well, um, that's, that's going to have to, those are going to be turned out. That's, that's, that's my daughter. Sorry. She's making faces <laughs> at good. me. Um, so um, th they'd have to be turned out. So we did. And by turning those out, we turned that whole stadium into a big stage. And it really informed all the Olympics past Barcelona into the into making it more of a theatrical presentation but that was the first one you know so Everything was there it. was there a pushback or hesitancy at all on their part when you said hey i want to light this completely differently or not, they said this is why we not at all here. as a matter but, of fact the best part of the whole the best way to sum it up of the cultural differences and still to this day americans don't realize um maybe they're starting to now because of what's happened but that that the rest of the world actually has incredible um, depth, history, what? intelligence. No. You know, uh, so you're telling me there's a world the, outside of the United States. And NBC had NBC had actually the, uh, breaking that Olympics, news on the DLC Drop podcast. NBC um, had the contract, and I introduced the first tracking camera that could keep up with a runner at really to Olympics. Yeah. Um, Where did that come from originally? Was that you well, said I used music? Or? I used something like it on McCartney in 89 okay. on the stages because I hated seeing cameras with booms and stuff. So I put them on tracks and we automated them. And wow. um, and oh. so we had that that camera actually ended up in America on NBC for basketball in the 90s. It used to be the yeah. overhead cam. They would go back. That was my invention. So oh, um, wow. that's cool. Anyway, well, I think one of the best, one of the most iconic shots of the Olympics is Michael Johnson outrunning that camera. And was that yeah. 96 in Atlanta? Yeah. No, that was 96 Atlanta. This is 92. Yeah. Right. But that's the same camera. I mean, it, it, yeah. it was the same camera. But the best part about the cultural differences were that the night before we, you know, went live, it was opening ceremonies. There was 114 cameras in the stadium. And I show up thinking, being American, there's going to be a rehearsal. You know, and ah. <laughs> I was living out. I was living outside the wow. city by the beach and they got me this really nice place on the sand. And yeah. um, and I. Uh, I show up and there's nobody in the stadium. Nobody's there except one guy. And it was my counterpart, my Spanish partner in lighting this whole event, Tomas. And I said, Tomas, where is everyone? What's going on? We're going live tomorrow. He goes, no, 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 no. He goes. We're going to be working very hard for the next two weeks. So we we're, and we gave everyone the day off to eat dinner with their families. I, wow. I so mean, how, did that, how did that go with no? Oh, it was great. We were flying. It was the energy because you're, what happens is you, you're not locked down by rules and regulations and everybody had vetted it and, and oh, there's no spontaneity. To, I mean, right. Humans are spontaneous. So, right. I mean, once you remove that and you put it on a checklist, it, it's boring. Interesting. It's boring. So, how did it go that you did went you do that if you were skateboarding? I mean, could you put your all your moves on a checklist and they're going to be exactly that way? 
You know what? There's different actually with competitions and video parts. This is relevant. So with competitions, uh, there's some skaters and they're they perform the best because they've they've uh, practiced it. Right. But someone like Nigel Houston is uh, is famous for he'll have an exact list of tricks and he'll he'll finish his last trick right at the buzzer perfectly. And then if he lands that perfectly, his next run will be that same run, but he'll add a couple harder tricks. But there's some guys like a guy named Evan Smith, who you would love Evan Smith. Um, guy just flies by the seat of his pants. He doesn't win very many uh, competitions, but he's the most exciting person to watch. Right. Because he's the guy who's going to uh, do a wall ride on the wall that's not even meant to be skated or ollie the, the rail out of the park. Um, and then you have, uh, with video parts, people will make a list of dream tricks, you know, like, okay, I want to get this trick and that's important at that level. But there's also quite a few stories of some of the most iconic tricks in skateboarding where it's like, I just showed up with my homies. Somebody else had their trick on the list. Right. And they asked if I wanted to session the rail with them. And so I started skating it and this trick worked out, you know, and now it's like, the super iconic yeah, trick. No, that so. makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. It's yeah. we're all, we all come from that tribe. It sounds like, you know, it's kind of more of a tribe where you're, it's a little bit more spontaneous. I mean, you fit yeah. in ultimately, but you're, you're just, you know, getting the, you're getting the, the, the waves, you know, you're accepting. Right. Them, you know? I don't want to sound too, too weird or metaphysical. <laughs> Well, I think too, like one thing I experienced in my skateboarding is momentum, not physical momentum, but the momentum of, of confidence. And so I've experienced throughout my like 26 years of skateboarding that when I land a trick, I'm more likely to land the next trick. And so right. there's been, there's been times I've landed a trick I've never done before that I went for because I landed two tricks before that. And I was like, just the confidence just built right. to where because skateboarding is so mental you know where at a certain point it's more it's more mental than physical because you have the ability to do so many things but you're scared to try it you're scared to do it or maybe it's just unique and it didn't come to mind and you just have to be extra creative to think i'm gonna do this thing in this moment no that makes perfect sense yeah it makes perfect sense so was there so in your career was there like a a big shift from going to doing like music with Pink Floyd to doing uh, events like the Olympics, or was that very organic? Well, I think what was happening was that rock and roll became rock and roll shows became so um, they became, well, you know, they became the iPhone. <laughs> they were, they, they were entertainers were the most popular thing in the world. And, you know, okay. you still had the Frank Sinatra's and everything, but they had, you know, they were older. They'd fallen backwards. Right. Just like EDM and rock and roll now, you know. Yeah. Even though, it, it, and then you have the big hip hop shows, but the big rock gods, you know, I mean, they, they, they have those generic shows that go out, but like the Stones, but let's face it, you know, you 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 know. It is what it is. So, I mean, God bless everybody. I'm not saying that negatively. Right. So, um, I, th I think that you, so because they were so big, they had such an influence that, that the Olympics wanted that energy. That, that's part of what I'm trying to say. They, and, and, and so did the TV stations, but TV always, they, they're, they're just, it's, you, I can't watch live shows, any kind of live event, maybe skateboarding or sports. It's fine. But once sure. you try to put music or theater on, yeah. on, on television, you know, or, or your laptop or your iPhone, or I, I find that the way they shoot it is from the 1950s. I think oh, wow. they need to approach it from a completely different um, creative place, which no one's willing to do. I mean, what, since what would that been, look like in your mind? Since we've been quarantined, these, these, award shows that have people at the home. I mean, it's probably the, the least interesting thing. I, I mean, why even bother? Right. You know? I mean, is there just, a concept in your mind of what you'd want to do? Yeah. I got lots of, I always have ideas. Yeah. Yeah. I call do. Mark or call me. If you have any ideas, I have Mark's unlisted phone number. Uh, so we, 
<laughs> there, I, I'm sure you could find my phone number these days. You find anything about anybody. Oh, I, I felt special that I had your phone number. No, I, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> Check that off the list. Okay. Well, um, tell me this. So you've had these, um, you know, you've taken risk, like you're, you're unafraid to take creative risk. Was there a moment and, you know, maybe it was, I remember you telling me about your, your bid to become the artist in residence at the empire state building, but was it that, or was there another experience where you felt intimidated or like, yeah, right. And I'm going to try anyway. I, I, I've never, I've never felt intimidated. I mean, even when I got to Spielberg, like they, they, when I, when I went to work for Steven, yeah. um, um, they, I call him Steven as well. Yeah. And Have you seen Steven's well, recent movie? It's which, Jurassic Park. It's great. No, I'm just kidding. No, <laughs> Keep going. when I went to work, when I went to work for Spielberg, I'll do that. Um, <laughs> um, I can't remember. I got the phone call. I would always get these weird phone calls. I was always yeah, the go to guy. I'm like the doctor, you know, I, I and then I'm the concierge doctor when people are like they really want to find solve their problems. That's kind of how it works for me. So for for I took a lot of meetings with the producers and direct and not 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 Spielberg, but it was everybody else. And finally, one day they said to me, we want you to meet Stephen tomorrow morning. You know, can you be here at nine o'clock or something? And I went, yeah, I don't want to meet him. And they're like, okay. like, what do you mean? I went, I, I, I don't want to meet him. I'm, it's like, I really respect him. I admire him. I like, all, you know, I like everything he does, but I, that's the point. I want to keep it that way. I want to, I want the God, like <laughs> never meet your heroes sort of a thing. Stay, yeah. Yeah. I don't want to meet the hero because then God, you know, turns out he's just a little smaller than I am. You know, that yeah, was when, horrible. He, when he puts out a cigarette on his intern, you're like, Oh, it's, it's spoiled. Which probably yeah. didn't happen. But no, yeah. he's a really nice guy. He used to live down the street from where I live. And a couple of years after I um, worked with him, um, I, I saw him pulling out of his driveway. And I was rolling my baby carriage. Yeah. <laughs> and he stopped to let me go by. And we looked at each other, but I wasn't going to do, hey, man, like, yeah. You know, he just <laughs> right. nodded. He knew I looked familiar, couldn't place me. But, you know, very right. pleasant. It's all good. I bet you guys have some pretty cool neighborhood watch meetings over there. No, we don't. As a matter of fact, <laughs> Pat Riley is 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 the 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 president of this neighborhood up here. And okay. I'm yeah, I'm not a big fan. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, if you want to get back at him, you could wear a Lakers jersey. Anytime. No, it's kind of an the us and them weeks. thing. He's turned it into, um, you know literally an us and them thing, which is really okay. pretty ugly, especially after the fires. But anyway. Well, that's unfortunate. Yeah. Well, you get old, me, man. Tell me a little bit about um, what you've done with the Empire State Building, because I tell a lot of people about the Empire State Building and the lights and the, the performances you've done. And either if there's anything you want to share that's coming or we we don't have to talk about that or, or, or things that you've done. And I think the story of you like getting that job was pretty cool, too. No, it's the same thing. I got a phone call and it was like they they needed there was a line of people wanting the job. But the, the owner, um, uh, um, a real a real visionary. Um, yeah. He um, he found me. And so I didn't think I was going to get it because there were so many, you know, legitimate, um, you know, organizations, companies, you know, big, yeah. big corporations that were all trying vying to take control of the building because they were putting all this new led lighting in. we luckily we got it. And sit, and we've been there now eight years. Um, and we continually try to innovate with the owner and the marketing team, you know, and um, it's been really one of the great experiences of my life. It, it rivals any rock star I've worked with, you know, it gives you That's that cool. much pleasure. And we've been real, again, we've been really, really lucky. I think it's just that, you know, if you get in a groove with some people each time you move from, it's not like the one thing is in what I do, I never get stuck in one place. So I, I can't okay. get into too many, you can't get into too many deep situations because you're not, you know, you're there for a moment, but you're not there every day. And you're not, right. const, you're not part of the everyday mix of things. 
Right. So your advice to people would be don't get stuck. I don't know. You know, I don't, it's not that I have a lot of advice. I mean, if you choose the path of being, you know, a sports person, an artist, you, you're going for your own, who you are, you know, and what, instead of trying to join a, like a corporate entity, you know, right. or, or, or other entity, if you have your own vision, it's really strong and you see it, then you, you, you just have to go for it. You know? Right. I mean, I, I, th I think that would be my advice and just believe, and you're going to fail a lot. I mean, tons of failures, but the failure yeah. is, is always the experience. It's the learning. Yeah. What well, was a big unlock for me was the moment I realized that failure didn't mean ultimate failure. No. Like it wasn't like you don't get any more chances and you're done and it's never again. It was okay. This thing didn't work out. Maybe the way that you had in mind, but you also are a different person than you were, were before you started because you learned while you tried. And that's what really exactly. Exactly. That's what encourages me is right. even with my company, I'm like, I, I mean, I like my chances, but I'm like, even if this doesn't work, think of all the things I'm going to learn while I try this that I'll be able to take wherever I'm going next that I would not have learn or experience if I exactly. didn't try this. No, that, I think that's the best way to look at it and you know and you can interact you, you can give as much as you want or pull back but you know i think the world is so connected now so connected it's a completely yeah. different world so it's even and lately i've been having these discussions internally it's just the way people communicate it's like again i was having this discussion with the empire state building we're about ready to launch um i'm not sure but we're going to do um simon the, the, the board game Simon yes. on the Empire State. I'm super Board. excited about this. So, you and so, I have been talking about this. Yeah, and, I'm and so to see that, that's life. finally yeah. that's finally going to happen. We have the we created the app. We got the the rights, and it should be great. It should be fantastic. So, um, and um, yeah, that, that 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 was. But I think it's the way we communicate. It's you can't people yeah. get their information in seconds now. I mean, they make their minds up. Their, our brains have changed. You, you have to accept that and learn. And for me, that's probably the hardest part of, because I, what I did, you know, I was raised when, it, you know, the horse and buggies were still around. So um, it, <laughs> that's probably the biggest challenge now is just, just to pick and choose how deep I want to get on certain subjects. Well, yeah. and how does it, um, how do you feel about everything being so like instant gratification? Like I know in skateboarding, this is a huge issue, especially with the OGs is people typically back in the day, skateboarders would put five years into filming a video part. And then they release the whole video with the team for the next five years or people are watching it until your next one. And so you put all this work and blood, sweat and tears and all these things into this project and then people are better now, so they're able to film parts faster. But now someone will put together a part that's they just put their body and their life on the line. And you watch on Instagram and you're like, cool. Next. Right. Never watch it again. Like I'm well, like, that, no, but that's what I mean. The, 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 it's it's the way everybody communicates. That that's still that's being that's still a work in progress. That's what I find most mesmerizing in the culture in uh -huh. the movement is 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 the battle between the way it was yeah and and the way people really do communicate and you always learn the way it's going from you know the younger generations especially the kids now they're into their teens and early 20s they they have a whole nother way language that's going on i have an right. 11 year old daughter so i feel really lucky that i'll be able to stay on on top of this for at least the next 15 years. <laughs> I'll be cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, in fact, the, the people who understand esports the most who are in their like 40s and 50s and 60s are the people who have teenage kids because they see it in their house. And so they're like, yeah, I get esports. I just yeah. ask my kid, what do they like to do? And then I apply that to my marketing strategy. Yeah, for, exactly. No, it, it's you know, Fortune yeah, she's, 500 brand. She's really tech savvy. I mean, you know, yeah. really, really tech savvy. And, and, um, yeah, I, I learn a lot from her every day. I really do. So I all, bet. Yeah. Well, what do you as we're as we're nearing the end here of this episode, you talked about what's most mesmerizing to you is how things were done, you know, back in the day versus how they're done in the future. Are there any things you'd like to share 
that you see or you think are are going to be the future, whether it's communication or entertainment? Well, I think right now we're in such a cu- cultural change that but when we finally come out of this, the pandemic, and when people feel safe again, um, yeah, they'll be older, number one. The, the world has moved on. What was what they call the normal that suddenly was shut down one day? It was right. like the party's over. We're closing the doors. Last call. Boom. Door shut. You yeah. know, and now here's your real life. And and coming out of this, I think, is really an exciting time. I mean, I'm very sad for, you know, all the loss of life and and everything that's gone on. It's horrible. And, right. Um, but out of that, I yeah. think I think there's a whole new communication level of people between people aside from the right. media without the media the normal media without that right. warring going on all constantly i think things like this again yeah. narrow casting um, and people trying to get authenticity out of their interactions with other people and that's where right. the truth really is when you talk to people we're we're all human we're all right. human made we're all here you know we all talk you know one way or the other, we all have those same emotions inside of us. So um, I think point. to me, that's finally coming to light. So that to me is the future. And where that goes, I have no idea. I think it's all positive, though. I think yeah. people will work out what they have to figure out to get along. I think it, I think the world's population really enjoys the fact that we're all connected. Yeah, you know, I think sometimes when we're, so much immediate gratification like like young people don't see like history before themselves and so i think it's easy sometimes i get pessimistic about the future and i'm like man you see everybody like fighting and all this stuff but i forget like we've been it's been thousands and thousands of years of conflict and societies and ups and downs and yeah. like it it appears bad at the moment but things are actually better you know from a a bigger scale, like things are better now than ever before in history, you know? And so I have to believe it's always a tune up. And so, you know, looking at history is a really good, good way of understanding what's going on. And, and, you know, and I've been, I've, I've had plenty of time. I've been home for seven months now. So, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is a, this has been a, this has been incredible. I've actually, I'm enjoying it. I mean, the thought of going anywhere, I just kind of think about it for a second, you know? I mean, I yeah. keep in New York now, but I'm like, well, but why? Normally I'd be right on the plane going, you know? Without a second thought. Yeah. Now you're like, well, I kind of like it here. We could zoom. Yeah. I, yeah. We I could zoom meeting. Yeah. But I've been remote for years. My whole crew, tactical maneuver, my whole team, everyone, we all work together. We have an artist collective. And yeah, uh, we've been working remotely since um, God, like, 209 208 209 so we're used to this this was when this happened this was we never had an office so we've always been this way well similar to the esports industry when everybody was like how do we do events with fans esports yeah no that makes sense yeah yeah that (laughs) makes perfect sense yeah exactly exactly i didn't even think about that but you're right they were like, yeah. we were trying to figure out how to do them with fans. <laughs> We've I been st- doing it for 20 years without fans online. I still want to, I still want to do some cool esports stuff. So, you know, we'll do it. I hope to one day. I think that would be great. Yeah, we'll make it happen. Well, All right, man. Anything uh, you want to, any, you want anybody to get in touch with you. you or you want to? No, just thanks for having me. It was fun. Absolutely. Well, All thank right. you for being on. It's a pleasure. And All right. it's great to see you as always. All right, John. You, take, you stay safe. And everybody you else. Too. See you later. All right, that was our good friend Mark Brickman on the DLC Drop podcast. A uh, huge thank you to Mark. He's a busy guy and um, love that he was willing to spend his time with us today. So uh, hope you got a lot of that podcast, uh, a lot of knowledge, a lot of experience and different things that Mark has experienced that nobody else has. So um, thank you once again to Mark Brickman of Tactical Maneuver. Thank you for listening to the DLC Drop Podcast. This podcast is part of the Esports Futuri Podcast Network and produced by Innovation Media Enterprises. Make sure you subscribe on your favorite podcast channel and leave us a review. 